Good day to you all. My name is Andrew Chung. I'm Artistic Director of Inner Chamber, and this is the next edition of Inner Chamber Connections. Inner Chamber Connections is our series of pre-concert chats with our guest artists and special guests. Um, today I've got with me Mike Fisher from Stream Studio, and soon we'll have Alexis Gordon joining us. And this is ahead of our concert on December 6th, and this is called Together Safe and warm. Okay, so Mike Fisher, uh, quick background on Mike. Let's say hello, Mike. Hi, Mike. Great. <laughs> Mike Fisher is the owner of Stream Studio. It's a digital event production company based in Stratford. Um, three fun facts about Mike Fisher. First of all, he himself is a musician. He's been playing music for 25 years. You can see that big bass behind him. Uh, he's been doing film for the past eight years, specializing in live events, especially music. Uh, he has filmed Lila Bialy, Mark Jordan, John McDermott, Steve Patterson, Julie, Julie Nazrella, as a few examples. Uh, Mike grew up in nearby Baden, and now he's a proud Stratford resident since 2008. So today, for our audience, we're going to talk about some of the secrets of video production, because for Inner Chamber, this whole season uh, is based on uh, live streaming our events truly broadcasting them live, not a pre-record. And this is where Mike comes into play and he is a total master at this. Sometimes we have our, our small in-person audience if we're allowed and we're hoping, fingers crossed, we will be allowed still on December 6th, um, but we're very much looking forward to this concert. So Mike, what are the range of things that you do as a videographer? Oh, well, uh, yeah, that has changed since COVID started. Before that, uh, I worked for an event company doing photography, video. Um, I've done sound for years as well, managing different bands and musical outfits that I've been in. Uh, but this year with COVID, it turned a different corner, um, doing live streaming, naturally. And uh, the combinations of doing virtual events. So very often it's pre-recorded stuff. So you go in and film, or you set up on location and stream a real time concert uh, and editing that goes along with that. Cool. Um, and ah. then we first met um, 2017. Uh, I think you filmed a concert of ours involving Dana Manning and mm -hmm. for uh, an 1867 uh, you know, concert, folk songs from that time. And I was super impressed with your work and we've collaborated on a number of things in London since then. Uh, you know, then COVID hit, March, 2020. Um, how did that change your business? So yeah, picking up from my last answer there, uh, I actually reached out to different musicians around fall of 2018 about live streaming. I wanted to do live streaming for musicians and it was kind of a big fat belly flop that everyone said, no, nah, I don't, I don't see a need for that. I don't, I don't think we would be into that at all to suddenly hitting the gas pedal that everybody, everybody needed live streaming in some way or another. And, and my goal actually with this, uh, I had all of my gigs canceled as well. I, I was in the same boat as everybody else where we just saw our, our calendars evaporate and disappear. And uh, my first question was not what now should I do that's different, but what now do all the regular people that I work with, all these relationships that I've built up over years and years, what do they need so they can continue to work? Because I've always seen myself as, as a facilitator um, so instead of building from the ground up, I had conversations with people like yourself and, and some key relationships in Toronto. And I said, what do you need? What do you need for your show to keep going? What, what is it that will help you get back up and going? Uh, some people relied on annual concerts for fundraisers and supporting their businesses. And really it was a conversation by conversation, uh, approach to, okay, let's find out a way to do this. Whether it was uh, doing the New Hamburg Mennonite release sale, their, their famous quilt auction, they were going to cancel it. Instead, they're getting twice, twice the funds per like the average quilt. 
And so now they're convinced that they can't go back to just being in person. And, and my, my goal is that we're not all just hobbling along and using this as a coping mechanism. Instead, we are using this as a way to enhance, augment, and, and actually make what everyone was offering more available and more accessible. So in a way, you, you've come in to save the day, but then uh, you've changed the playing field kind of too. That's what we've discovered, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a complete response. And there's some things that I've kept. There's some things that I got rid of. But at the end of the day, it's really solution oriented. It's does this work for you? And how can we make it better? And even with us every month, or even seems like every two weeks, we're doing a different event. We're changing it slightly. We're tweaking it, improving it, getting rid of things, keeping things. And that's the way I like to keep, keep the, uh, the change going is based on that sort of real solution. Uh, what works for the people, what works for the ticket holders, for the concert planners, the musicians. Now, not, not all uh, videographers uh, dip their toe into the world of of mute, live music events. So why, you know, why does that attract you? Uh, I've always been a musician. Age six, I remember saying, I want to be a musician when I grow up. And uh, I did play music professionally uh, from, from as early as I could. I think age 17, I was playing concerts. Age 19, I was playing Lulu's Roadhouse before it closed down. Yeah. And I played right up until about 2016, which is when I went completely full time with video. And I often tell young videographers or, or people who want to do videography that we all need a niche. We all need a network of people. Videographers don't need to hire videographers. So find your people, find your passion and, and go after that. And so for me, it was a little bit, uh, you know, the music industry is difficult enough. Here I am showing up with the camera saying, Hey, I'm going to be a music videographer. And, uh, five years later, um, it's been a tremendous success and it is, I have traded my instrument. I've traded my bass for a camera. And <laughs> as a result, I'm playing with better musicians and better stages, better, better venues. And uh, it's amazing because anytime the video team shows up, everyone puts on their best show because it's going to go out to the world. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to film always really incredible events. And uh, I, feel like, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy at the gig, especially when I'm recording in a music studio. Who else gets to stand on the music studio floor while someone's creating an album? And, and just witness it there on the studio floor. Yeah. And that's me. So this is absolutely a dream job, 100%. I love it. You've traded in that base for uh, not just the camera, but like eight cameras and a whole lot of gear. Like and a whole lot of gear. It must satisfy the, the gear head in you <clears throat> because there's all these pieces. And, you know, I mean, we've talked about this over many hours. And, you know, if one thing is slightly out of sync with the video and the audio, well, then you, you try to find the problem or, you know, you recently bought a battery backup that weighs as much as I do, or, you know, there's like all this gear. It's like unbelievable all to make sure that the live stream can happen reliably and, and, and truly live. It's, it's, it's remarkable. So, you know, just touching on that. So we've, you know, we've become quick best friends this, this whole season. Um, you're filming all of Interchambers events. You're, um, doing film for all of our stuff in London, for London Symphony, where I'm artistic producer. Um, so, you know, what are, what are three of the things that, uh, real game changers that you've, you know, that have happened over the past, I don't know, six months even, uh, little developments where we, we've realized, oh, okay, well, this is, this is a really neat addition to what we do. Uh, wow, where do I begin? Because it's been a constant learning curve and you've been on the phone for a lot of them, which is pretty neat. Because again, I'm, I'm more interested in, in practical, practical solutions, not just, hey, what, what looks good on my, on my geek bench, but what, what works out in the real world. And a lot of that is actually simply error prevention. I remember an early job, in fact, it was our test. We did a test concert and 
probably within the first four bars of the song, I had to come over and tap your shoulder and ask them to stop playing. Oh, that's right. This is August, August 26th. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's how fast this happens. Yeah. yeah. So that little error of having your computer go completely black four bars into, uh, into a piece resulted in a purchase of about $4,000 worth of equipment, <laughs> you know, and I was capable of doing it before. Yeah. But uh, when you've got thousands of people watching an event and, and something as large as London Symphonia where there's, uh, you know, luckily we had two people on the stage, but if there was a concert as big as there was last Saturday with Sarah Celine, uh, I don't want to be the one that keeps the show from going. <laughs> and so as a result, I've got power redundancy, network redundancy, hardware redundancy. Yes. Um, and there's no, there's no manual. There's no like, you know, video for dummies that you just pluck off the shelf and it tells you the 10 things you've got to buy. There's a lot of problem solving and, and, you know, just, just using your brain and you're building uh, an figuring out the, the solutions, right? Yeah. You're building an ecosystem is what you're doing because yes. it's, you know, it's enough to learn cameras. It's enough to learn a particular piece of hardware or the network engineering side of it, but then you have to put it all together. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I always feel that when technology works just right, it becomes magic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're really entering that realm where we're having, uh, you know, hundreds of people unite and be able to watch music in real time, mm -hmm. sound and look beautifully. I don't know. I think, you know, backup, Anything, anything before, well, I guess this is also television, but what we're doing is becoming independent television. Yes. And that's the standard that I'm, that I'm reaching towards and the conversations I'm having with people, mm -hmm. um, artistic producers like yourself, but also a close friend who I'm on the phone with is equally is uh, an owner of a large studio in Toronto who was head of sound on Saturday Night Live for a year. And these are the standards that I think we will be approaching right now. It's very forgivable uh, to have slow internet connection or something drop. Everyone's saying, Oh, it's the technology, but it won't be long before we expect the same kind of quality as television. So yes. I think everybody is uh, climbing those stairs as fast as they can. And, you know, previously one would, film an event like like a concert event you would have your multiple angles and you'd spend weeks on the cutting room floor you know deciding which angle was best and uh you know oh okay i'm i'm you know listening to i'm listening to you're listening to the music and we want to see this particular angle or this cello featured or whatever but the art of what you do is that you're doing it you're doing it in in, in real time so you know that dress rehearsal when you are internalizing the music you're kind of memorizing the flow of it and what, what happens. And I try to keep your mind clear for that. Uh, Cause that is, you know, a, a really key hour, a couple hours, you know, where you're internalizing that music so that for the live stream itself, you're, uh, you're doing it in real time. It's, it's, it's quite a feat. Let me assure you. So you're behind the camera, but you're kind of not behind the camera. So you use eight camera angles. And I guess the art of what you do is, um, well, maybe you can describe, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you figure that you are doing a good job as a, as a, as a videographer, as a switcher between these different angles? So this draws on my experience of doing so much music editing and that I know exactly what I'm going to be looking for. I know the angles that just, I'm not going to use, you know, I used to set up eight angles, but then you end up editing with four of them because four of them were just okay. Or you put them up sort of, um, trying to be safe with the angles, but in the end, the angles didn't offer anything exciting. Uh, your feedback to me from the last few concerts was, we, we wanna feel close. We wanna feel close to the musicians and close to the music uh, because that is next best to live. And so there is an art in placing the angles so that you can then switch and have it be interesting and sensible. So that's the first piece is getting the angles in, in the correct positions uh, and there is, there's a, there's a science and an art to that. And there's some people that have said to me, I don't know quite how you do that. And the same way that I look at them as they do, you know, professional documentary filmmaking and say, I don't know how you do that. Um, but we find our niches and I'm, I'm probably doing, uh, 75 concerts per year for the last five years. And now it's been a few concerts per week. 
So that, that number has really gone up. Yeah. Um, so when, when I'm at the switching board, I'm essentially doing a live edit. I am editing on the fly. And frankly, when I edit at home in my suite too, I have to have a fast enough computer that I can play it back without having to pause. Because as a friend told me when I was learning the upright bass, you're not training your hands to play, you're training your ears to play. And so with the video switcher, your eyes have to work and your hands have to work, but the, the real work, the real work is your ears. Hmm. And so understanding rhythmically, um, you know, uh, uh, there's almost no time to think that when you hear the cello, you've already cut to cello. Yeah. You're, anticip you're anticipating too, using your ears. You're anticipating what's going to happen. Yeah. And I wish I could run a camera at the same time. Um, because as someone who runs a camera who is also musical will know that the music is a dance when you're using a camera. Mm -hmm. There's movement that has to match the tempo and the mood. And, uh, and then the switching part of it is also part of that dance too. You can, you can evoke chaos or simplicity or mystery and you can force the viewer's eye. Yep. Um, yeah, if we're hearing the cello but I'm looking at your face, we're having your experience listening to the cello. Yes. So you're creating a musical experience for the viewer, um, you know, and they're listening with their ears, but all that eye stuff is happening unconsciously to enhance the music. Um, so I've been really, really lucky to work with incredible audio engineers. And John Hazen is no exception. He, mm -hmm. he does such an amazing job of sound and he wants to see the image as well as he's cutting. Uh, and John, John is our sound engineer for these, for these concerts as well, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So he asked specifically, can I see a monitor so I can see visually what's going on? Because when he's mixing, he wants to mix it so it sounds correct yeah. to, to the visual. And then Stephen doing lighting. Likewise, I can't, I don't have room to change colors or lighting or exposures after the fact. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Stephen's had to deal with me needling to get, you know, minimize shadows here, hot spots there, or a little brighter on your face and less on Ben's face or whatever it may be. Um, you do all that work ahead of time mm -hmm. so that you can just edit it on the spot and not have to do any fixes later on. So it's actually improving. Uh, you know, why don't we always work to the standard to make it as absolutely best as possible during capture and not mm -hmm. have to do what so many filmmakers say, which is fix it in post. That means modifying it afterwards there is no afterwards yeah. it's exciting it's exciting yay live mike thank you so much for joining us today i've we've run out of time but um everyone will see your work on uh december 6th and and this is for uh our concert together safe and warm live from revival house uh, you can get our tickets at uh innerchamber.ca thanks for joining us and we'll talk soon and now we welcome Alexis Gordon, and Alexis is our guest singer for our concert, uh, Together Safe and Warm. Hello, Alexis. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit about you just so people know, in case they don't know. Alexis is a professional actress hailing from London, Ontario. Alexis is most well known for her four seasons at the Stratford Festival, starting out by playing the lead Julie Jordan in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel. She's performed on numerous occasions in her hometown at the Grand Theatre um, in London, most recently with the Canadian premiere of a stage play adaptation of Emma Donoghue's award-winning novel and movie, Room. This play was to continue on to the Mervish stage in Toronto, but due to COVID-19 was cancelled. Boo! A remount is hopefully coming in the next year or so. She enjoyed a season at the beautiful Shaw Festival in 2019, starring as Fiona in Lerner and Lowe's romantic musical Brigadoon, and also Layla in Rope. Alexis is the recipient of the Banks Prize for Emerging Artist, the inaugural winner of this award from the prestigious Musical Stage Co. in Toronto. So Alexis, you're performing a number of songs on this program. I think it's seven in total. Um, some of these don't need any introduction. Uh, we've got Song for a Winter's Night by Gordon Lightfoot, but Both Sides Now uh, by Joni Mitchell, 
Oh, holy night. Oh, holy night. I think that's, is that Adolf Adam or, uh, yeah, we'll get there. Um, and what else is on the program? Oh gosh, we're doing Home from the Wiz. Um, this is when I'm like, oh gosh, I need my notes now. What else are we doing? Solitude by Duke. Solitude, Solitude by Duke Ellington. A little jazz. We're doing, um, and two Canadian uh, musical theater composers. We're doing uh, Leslie Arden's Nothing Can Prepare You from House of Martin Gare. And we're doing Mother's Lullaby from Kevin Wong's Recurring Chun. Tell me more about this. So Mother's Lullaby. So it's um, part of a song cycle. Is that right? Yeah, Kevin was a lawyer and then he decided he did not want to be a lawyer. He wanted to be a musical theater composer. So he made that classic switch as you do. <laughs> um, Genius move. Genius. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, and we did it at the Toronto Summer Works Festival in 2014, I believe. Um, and yeah, it's about John, but you never meet John. You meet a bunch of characters around John and they sort of tell different bits of their experiences with him. And this is right at the beginning. Uh, this young mother uh, singing sort of her hopes and wishes for her her baby, her son, her John. Beautiful. And you were involved in the premiere of this. So yeah. I, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So um, what else do we have? We've got, tell me about Leslie Arden. So this is a song, Nothing Can Prepare You, from? From the House of Martin Gare. I actually, I put it on my CD. I've never worked with Leslie, but I've met her several times and I so admire her genius. Um, she writes like Stephen Sondheim, but she's her own thing. But there's, I don't know, her text is, and her, oh my goodness, her score is complex and beautiful. Um, so I, yeah, I wanted, I knew I wanted a song from it. I've never seen House of Martin Gare, but it's been done sort of in Charlottetown at Stratford in concert um, a lot recently. So um, I was thrilled in 2018 to throw it on my CD and and have Canadian representation, Canadian composers um, being sung on my CD so people can open up their scope of musical theater. Bonus. And you have a CD. Can you tell people a little more? <laughs> it's called Summertime. I didn't do the Spotify, Apple thing. I, sh I really should look into that. Um, I was, as I was making it, I realized why people just don't make CDs. Um, it's a little more complicated if you get all the licensing done correctly. Uh, and it's a little backwards. They want you to print the CDs and then they'll give you the licensing to sing it. But then you go, but if I don't get the licensing, then I've made 500 CDs that I have to throw out. Anyway, it was a process. <laughs> but, a I was, process. Oh yes. goodness, but I was so happy to do it that season. Uh, I was only doing plays at Stratford in 2018. So I thought, I've got to sing. So I, I made a CD um, and it's, it's hard copy and I still have a bunch of people are local in Stratford and want them, let me know. You'll probably have them at the show, in fact, on December 6th. Hey, why not? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's very cool. Um, now, uh, you're singing a song called Home, and uh, this is from The Wiz by, by Charlie Smalls. Tell us a little bit about this. I wasn't really familiar with this, to be completely honest, but uh, this is amazing. Yeah, I'd never sung the song before. Uh, Marcus Nance at the Stratford Festival, actually last season, he wrote this beautiful, he put together this beautiful concert called Why We Tell the Story that uh, explored black musical theater. Uh, and he tied in a bunch of beautiful poems uh, by Langston Hughes in between. Um, and again, to just educate people on black musical theater and that it's not all pain and suffering, but that the BIPOC representation is so important. Uh, but the fun, the fun thing is a lot of black musical theater, when you look it up, is actually written by white people. So that's also an interesting thing. But there's also a power in, like, The Wiz being an all-black cast was historic. Um, that was huge. I usually like to stick to legit musical theater, so this was a foray into sort of the mixy belt world. Uh, so I was very nervous singing it, but I love singing. I love singing that song. There's, there's a lot of power in what home is um and i think even especially now in a pandemic that that is twisted into an, an even more complex thing but especially the idea of home for the holidays i think that evokes a lot right now uh in people's hearts so to sing about something like home and being safe and home mm. was a really neat choice for us it resonates for sure um, and charlie smalls black composer attended juilliard you know he won the tony award for best score for this 
for this piece and you know the movie i think it stars uh, dana ross and michael jackson and and yeah. among others yeah incredible incredible stuff so i look forward to pulling yeah. that with you yeah for sure so you know, uh, let's talk about diversity and music programming, because this is a, a really, really important topic. Um, how do we represent uh, BIPOC, you know, peoples and more diversity in our programming? What's your what's your take on it? Where does it start? Yeah, I was trying to do, um, I've done a few like Zoom online concerts, and especially this summer, I think the whole world was shifting into how do we support BIPOC artists and how do we do that better or properly. Uh, so I, I went through the, okay, like what in my score that I love singing um, was actually, uh, or, or is BIPOC forward uh, with casting, let alone uh, who wrote it. So that was sort of a neat journey. Something like Ragtime or Once on this Island was actually written by Aaron and Flaherty. So you go, okay, it was written by two white people, but those were the first two musicals that came to my brain when thinking of diverse musical theater. Um, so I thought, like, okay, I have to do better. I have to dig deeper and learn a bit more. So then you have The Wiz, which again, I sort of stray away from not being a belter myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I kept digging. Um, there's stuff like House of Flowers. There's a lot of like sort of more obscure ones or like Carmen Jones. That was a huge sort of um, operetta musical theater movie when it came out. Again, like huge, uh, Porky and Bass, huge ensembles of, of black people on stage, which is so powerful to see. But again, either your creative team or the writers are mostly white or taken from stories written by people of color and then made into Broadway musicals by uh, a mostly white team. Mm -hmm. um, and not all the time, where again, like The Wiz is a bit more groundbreaking or something like Dream Girls, but um, it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated. And I, I think complicated. that it's- It's, it's confronting a, too. I'm sure sometimes it's quite confronting because for you personally, it's a, it's a, it's a journey of discovery too, right? You, you, you know, you and myself, you know, we make assumptions as, um, you know, who, who's composed this, or, you know, you think it's, uh, maybe it's a black composer, but then it's not, and it's composed by someone who's white, and you're like, okay, so it's a, it's a journey of discovery, it's, it's about endeavoring to, to, to dig deeper, and, and, and to find, um, find those voices, and, and program them, you know, it's, um, it's not obvious that, yeah. how to do this, um, you know, in talking about this, you know, it's, it's, it's about collaboration too, right? Like it's entering a conversation. Yeah. Um, and we definitely wanted your voice in, in, in this and programming what songs you wanted to sing. And, and I think we've got some great stuff. Um, yeah, the importance of teamwork and yeah. um, exposure that, okay, so it was written by a white team and how beautiful that they created this opportunity for an all black ensemble. Like where can we get more of that sort of team effort of, uh, if, if the Broadway big wigs are mostly white, how can they reach out and extend opportunities to BIPOC people to get their name as big uh, just because money <laughs> tends to be the driving force or popularity uh, and maybe BIPOC artists don't get that opportunity as much. So how do, yeah, how do we make that teamwork better? Uh, for our concert list too, we wanted Canadian composers. We wanted we wanted to keep it diverse, but also like local as well, because we have beautiful Canadian theater, uh, musical theater composers that maybe aren't well known and they should be, they should be just as well known because they write beautiful things, but there's a Broadway bias instead of a at home Canadian pride that we, we get to revel in now. Yeah, we do get to revel in it. And so we just got to put it out there, right? And we've just got to take a step back and not make assumptions. You just do the same old standards. You kind of endeavor, go that little bit further. You know, I like that. And I think it makes it better. We get we get classic staples like Oh Holy Night or classic Gordon Lightfoot or classic Joni Mitchell. But then we get to also learn about something new. And I think that that's an enjoyed experience when you get the sprinkle of nostalgia and the sprinkle of like, I didn't know that song, but now I'll never forget it. Yeah, totally. So um, over this past few months, you've been uh, part of the team, the artistic team at, at Shaw Festival. Uh, and preceding that, you were uh, making cheese, as I understand it, you know? Not making it, but wrapping it. Wrapping uh, it. Not wrapping. a cook at all, or shouldn't be trusted with the chemistry of making cheese. 
But yeah, I worked at Monforte Dairy in Stratford, Ontario for three months this summer. Uh, and then I got a call from Tim Carroll at the Shaw Festival and he sort of plucked me back into the arts and singing and uh, at the beginning of September. And I, we've luckily kept extending, we're all distanced. We have moved inside, so we have less audience members, but to be able to sing in this time has been um, an emotional uh, journey for sure. It's been amazing. What was that? What was that like? That first concert back. So this is in September, right? When you you guys rehearsed and then you you sang that first concert. What was that like coming back after COVID? Yeah, they got government funding from FedEv Ontario, uh, from the government of Canada, and I think we all got the call about like a week before. So all of us were like, yes. Uh, I don't know what this is, but yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we all showed up on the first day and can't hug each other. Uh, I'm one of eight performers, and um, I think most were already here for the season. Um, I was luckily, very fortunate to just sort of get plucked out of the oblivion to join them, so I hadn't seen a bunch of them in a while. Um, and you can't hug, and you're all masked, and we were in an outdoor tent learning music uh, with Paul on the keyboard or Ryan on the keyboard, depending on the day. Um, yeah, the first harmony together, especially, uh, was really emotional. Yeah. Uh, to be able to sing with each other, where maybe we've sung online on Zoom to our laptops, which we're really lucky to do, but it just feels completely different. <laughs> but let alone when we first had our band in, we get an upright bass and uh, drums now. Uh, that was <laughs> like a 60 piece orchestra. Uh, so every sits probe we had, we were just emotional all over again. Um, and yeah, we, we keep extending. I think it was supposed to end October 24th and then November 24th and now December 19th is our closing. Um, and the power of having audiences there distanced, uh, it's, it's a concert series, there's no plot, but everyone cries because that's how we know theater's not gonna die. The power of gathering and listening to live music together, as much as we're distanced and safe and masked, uh, is very emotional. Um, it's very beautiful to be a part of and, and to energy share, to share that joy with people through song has been so stunning in this time. Oh my goodness. Every, uh, every concert that I'm a part of, I just, it's like, I'm so thankful and I, I'm just, you know, so grateful for the opportunity to make musicians, make friends rather with, with musicians once again. And, uh, you know, and, and, um, uh, just perform together and it's like oh we've been waiting for so long so every every interaction every rehearsal every every concert just takes on so much more meaning it's what mm -hmm. it's what we do you also have additional skills to be able to wrap cheese but you know mm -hmm. this is this is your bag and um I a lot of cheese yeah I did. <laughs> we we just can't wait to to perform with you coming up on on december 6th thank you so much for joining me today for our brief chat alexis um, and so, you know, for those at home who wanted to catch our live stream, and it is truly a live concert uh, being streamed live, this is December the 6th, uh, live from uh, Revival House. The concert starts at 7, and we have uh, this pre-recorded Zoom chat playing from 6.30. Um, you can buy tickets at innerchamber.ca. You can also buy a delicious takeaway meal as... Um, honoring the tradition of meal plus concert, which is what we do at Inner Chamber. Uh, so you can find out more on the website. And thank you again for joining us. And we'll, we'll see you all soon.